Hello friends, this is Miss Britt. I am going to be reading a book to you today called Saturdays and Tea Cakes. It is available on Epic. If you want to read it again, you can just search the title. I'm going to give you a brief summary of the text before I begin reading. So this is for my writing fundamentals. I'm gonna be reading this section to you there. Saturdays and Tea Cakes by Lester Laminac. Lester Laminac says, I wrote this book to honor my grandmother, my mother's mother, my mama, or mamma. As a child, I loved the time I spent with her because like no other grown up, she had the time to make me the center of her attention, to make me feel so very special. Everyone should have at least one person who can make him or her stand taller, feel bolder, and smarter. This is a true story from Lamernack's childhood. His retelling is as true as his memory of it. This story takes a slice of his life and gives readers a close look into that special time spent with his grandmother. This eloquently written story uses sensory details and other literary devices such as personification, onomatopoeia, similes, repeating lines, internal thinking, vivid verbs, transitions, and dialogue. What a great book to study author's craft. Make sure to share Lamernack's website with your students and see where he gets his ideas. Plus, learn the recipe for his grandmother's tea cakes. So I'm going to quickly show you his website and I did put the link in um, our daily schedule. So Lamernack's website is here and I went on ahead and clicked on the section that said works because these are some of the other books that he has written and you can read through um, where he gets some of his um, insight for writing his books. So his inspiration for writing his books. If you want the grandmother's recipe for Saturdays and tea cakes, it is right here on the right hand side. So you can read the ingredients and then he tells you step by step how to do it. So if you are interested in making that recipe. All right, let's get started. Saturdays and Tea Cakes. Remember, it is available on Epic if you want to search the book by yourself and reread it. All right, Saturdays and Tea Cakes by Lester Laminac. When I was nine or 10 years old, I couldn't wait for Saturdays. Every Saturday, I got up early, dressed, and rolled my bicycle out of the garage. So you can see his beagle. It looks like a beagle to me, and here he is on his bicycle. Every Saturday, I coasted down our long, steep drive, slowing only enough to make the turn onto Thompson Street, then left onto Bells Mill Road, Pedal, pedal, pedal past Miss Cofield's house. Pedal, pedal, pedal around the horse pasture and up the hill past the cemetery where my grandfather was buried. Pedal, pedal, pedal past Miss Grace Owen's house and on up to Chandler, Chandler's Phillips 66. So maybe you've already noticed that one thing the author is doing is repeating the words every Saturday. Okay. Saturday. Here again, every Saturday. And the author is also pedal, pedal, pedal past. And just, it's a, it's a way of being repetitious that gets the um, reader more interested in what you are reading, what they have written. Every Saturday, I coasted over the black hose by the gas pumps just to make sure, the, just to make the bell ring. Then I dropped my kickstand and checked the air in my tires. I stopped at Chandler's for another reason too. That's where I crossed the highway that ran right through the center of town. So those are the reasons why he stops. Also, look here, I'm about to read this part to you. Do you see these italicized words? This is going to be a memory that he has had. So he is, what he writes in italics is going to be, from, he is gonna be recalling it exactly from his memory. My mother always said, you stop and you look both ways when you get to Chandler's. I don't care if the light is green. I'll hear about it if you don't. And I knew she would too. In our little town, everyone knew everybody 
and told everything to everyone who would listen. So I always looked both ways. So he always stops here on purpose because he knows that if he doesn't stop there, that his mother is going to know because everybody in the town is going to tell her. So he purposely would stop there just so he wouldn't get in trouble. Pedal, pedal, pedal. You see how he's repeating that again? Across Rose Street, then left for a slow coast down behind the bank of Heflin, where I turned right onto Bedwell and whoosh, I zoomed downhill as fast as I dared. Pedal, pedal, pedal. Up the next hill and left onto Almond Street. It was a long stretch to Mr. White's. Always, I always stopped there to catch my breath in the shade of the old oak tree. One more small hill. Pedal, 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 and then a right onto Gaither Street. Now I could see my grandmother's drive. So if you'll look, whoosh is an example of onomatopoeia. Whoosh. It's an example of onomatopoeia because it is something that you can write or spell, and it's also something that you can hear. I also like how the author took the word pedal and kind of extended extended it out right here to show that the author was having trouble getting up the hill. So that's kind of like the effort that the author was putting into it. So that was another example of how he is trying to get the reader's attention and he is being intentional as a writer. One, two, three, four driveways and one last turn to the left. This was where my tires gave up their humming on pavement and began the crunching of gravel. Just before reaching Mammal's back porch, I slammed on my brakes, sending a shower of tiny pebbles into her flowers. Every Saturday, Mamma was there, sitting on her old metal glider. Crick, crack, crick, crack. Sipping a cup of red diamond coffee and waiting. She was waiting for me. No one else, just me. You can tell how much the author loves this moment. He remembers it so vividly in his details and he is telling us his memory and we are able to relive this moment with him because of how well he has written about it. And then the illustrator has added this wonderful, it looks more like an oil painting, has um, put this oil painting or oil picture like in here so that we can see just how much they, they share that love and that bond together. Every Saturday, Mamaw called out, come on into this house, let's have us a bite to eat. In Mamaw's big kitchen, sunlight poured through the windows like a waterfall and spilled over the countertops, pooling up on the checkerboard floor. Every Saturday, she had hot biscuits, sweet butter, and golden eagle syrup waiting on the kitchen table. Every Saturday, she poured a little bit of coffee in my cup and filled the rest with milk, and two spoon spoonfuls of sugar. Then, before long, Mamma said, we best clear these dishes away and get at that yard before it gets too hot. I followed her out to the back porch. Let me put a little water on these ferns, she said. You go on ahead to the car house. That's what Mamma called the garage. I'll be out directly. So I like how the author is putting his Mamma's words in italics. I like that because I can change my voice a little bit and try to sound like Mamma might have sounded. And then I like reading words that I know people used to say, like I'll be out directly instead of I'll be out in just a moment. That's what that means, but she, that's a word that she used and he wanted to put that in there. I'll be out directly. My grandma uses that word. By the time I pulled the old lawnmower from the garage, Mamma was already in the garden picking plump, ripe tomatoes for our lunch. Every Saturday, I pulled the starter rope again and again while the mower sputtered and spit. Finally, that old mower started and I struggled to push it through the dew-wet grass, leaving row after row of fresh stripes on the lawn. So you can see his stripes in the picture. 
but I like how he said that it was a dew wet lawn because dew is like the water that's on the ground, like the little bit of moisture that's on the ground. And I like how he said that because it also helps me to know that this was a harder job because the ground wasn't quite dry yet and it's hard to mow grass when it's still slightly wet. From time to time, the mower choked on mouthfuls of wet grass that clung to the blades and to my bare legs. But by early afternoon, the dew pearls were gone. The grass was mowed and dry and I was soaked with sweat. Every Saturday, I pushed the mower back into the garage, trudged to the back porch, and flopped onto that old glider. Crick, crack, crick, crack. So the author did something else here. So before I tell you what the author did on this page, I want to back up real quick. Nope. Leave. And go back to the whoosh sound. Remember I told you the whoosh was onomatopoeia. I wanted you to know how to spell that. So onomatopoeia, that's the word onomatopoeia. I told you that the whoosh is something that you can hear, but it's also something that you can spell. These are some other examples of words that you can hear and words that you can spell. So gush, you can hear when water is gushing but you can also spell the word gush. So the flood water gushed through the town. You can hear an owl hoot and you can spell the word hoot, just like bark and meow or howl. So you can talk about how a um, wolf is howling or you can say at night the wind was howling. Now this example at night, the wind was howling can the wind really howl? No, it cannot. So that leads me to my next example, which is personification. So the author is also using examples of personification on this page when he said that the mower would sputter and spit and that it, I'm sorry, that the mower would choke on mouthfuls. Choke. Can a mower choke? No. People can choke, animals can choke, but mowers cannot choke. So personification is when you give something that is not a human or an animal a, a quality that they can't have, like mowers cannot choke. There, we actually say that the mower choked, but it doesn't mean the same thing as us choking. Some other examples would be the car danced across the icy road. Cars don't dance. The angry clouds marched across the sky. Well, the clouds can't be angry, but we use the word angry clouds to kind of talk about um, when clouds are dark and gloomy and it looks like they're about to rain. The stars in the clear night sky winked at me. Stars are not winking at you. Yes, the stars may be twinkling and you know seem brighter or less bright from moment to moment, but they're not really winking at you and the tulips nodded their heads in the breeze. No, the wind is blowing the tulips. They're not really nodding their heads because they don't technically have heads to nod. So those are some examples. And Mr. Le uh, Lamanac used an example of that right there in the story. So as a writer, you try to use words that get your audience's attention or the person that is reading the book, you use words that gets their attention to make the book more interesting. And those are some things that you're going to be doing as a writer as we continue to learn about this unit. Mamaw soon appeared with a tall glass of sweet iced tea. You just cool off and rest a spell. I'm gonna make us a bite to eat. But before long, she came back with two big tomato sandwiches on hamburger buns. Every Saturday, I gobbled mine down like a hungry dog and she nibbled at hers like a bird. So he ate really quickly and gobbled it down like a, like a dog and his grandma ate hers very slowly and kind of ate like a bird, like small amounts at one time. Now them some good tomatoes, she said. I know how you like a good tomato sandwich. Don't they taste a whole heap better when you just picked them? 
We sat there a while listening to the calls of the Blue Jays and the rhythm of that old glider. Then Mamma looked at me sort of sideways and said, I reckon I know a boy who'd like something sweet to eat. And I grinned. Yes, ma'am, I reckon you do. So I also want to pause here just to talk about he remembers these moments from his childhood so much because his grandmother spent one-on-one -on -one time with him and she kind of gave him her undivided attention. Yes, he was there to help her, but with him helping her do yard work on Saturdays, he got to spend some quality time with his grandmother and now he has all of these wonderful memories and I'm sure you guys have family members that you get to spend quality time with and those memories are going to be something that you take into adulthood and you're just going to cherish forever. Come on then, Mamma said, heading toward the door. Let's get in this kitchen and see if we can't make us a mess. Every Saturday, she spread a cloth over the red countertop and scattered a fistful of flour across it, sending a cloud into the air then she set out a big bowl. Mamma dipped a china teacup into the canister of flour, scooped out a cupful, and skimmed over the top with her finger. Then she dumped the flour into the bowl and added sugar from her black cookie jar. She let the mixture drift through her hands like I, like I sifted sand at the beach. When it felt right, Mamma said, look in the frigid air, that's what she called a refrigerator, and find me two sticks of blue bonnet. So two sticks of blue bonnet is also what she's going to be calling butter and her frigid air is her refrigerator. I pulled open the refrigerator and got out the margarine, which is butter. I unwrapped the sticks and dropped them into the bowl. I mixed and mashed and mixed and mashed until the ingredients disappeared into a paste. It was smooth and pale yellow and smelled like fresh cotton candy at the county fair. Mamma pinched off a little to taste. I expect we need a little more sugar in this. She sprinkled sugar until the dough tasted the, just the way she thought it ought to. Now get me three eggs, she said. I tapped the first egg too hard, making it splatter onto the counter and down the outside of the bowl. I reckon we will have to call that half an egg, Mamma said. Here, let me show you how to do it. Just tap them easy like and pull the shell apart over the bowl like this. Now you do the next one. So here they are mixing that. It was hard work blending those eggs into the mix with a long wooden spoon. Mamma pinched another taste. My goodness, buddy. We didn't put no vanilla in here. Reach up in that cabinet and get me down the bottle of vanilla flavor. When the dough tasted just right, Mamma rolled it out on the flour, flour dusted cloth. Then I cut out the tea cakes with the rim of an old tin can. We carefully lifted the circles onto a, circle, onto a cookie sheet and put them in the oven to bake 375 degrees for 15 minutes. In case you don't know what an old tin can is, it's like using a can that you um, like for veg like that you buy vegetables in, like a can of corn. It's like emptying out the corn and then washing the can and saving it to cut out your cookies later. Those 15 minutes seem to last forever. Are they ready, Mamma? Not yet, buddy. Are they ready now, Mamma? Not yet, buddy. Let's give them a bit longer. Are they ready yet, Mamma? I reckon they might be. She opened the oven door and the kitchen filled with a smell sweeter than summer gardenias, the smell of tea cakes. Every Saturday, I reached for one still steaming on the baking sheet. You better wait, buddy. They are gonna be mighty hot just yet. We waited until the tea cakes were cool enough to lift them from the baking sheet. Then we set them off on a plate. Every Saturday, I ate one and then another and then I looked at Mamma. Is that all you want, buddy? You be sure to eat all you want. We made them tea cakes just for you. When I had eaten all I could, she set a few off on a saucer for herself and put the rest on a big sheet of aluminum foil. She folded the edges to make a little handle for the top. 
Now you put these out there in your bicycle basket so you won't forget them. So he would go and take his little cookies to his bicycle. Every Saturday as I pedaled over the gravel again and out Mamaw's drive, I glanced back over my shoulder. Every Saturday, Mamaw was there, sitting in her old metal glider and waving. She was just waving to me, no one else, just me. I love how the author is, you know, putting Mamaw back in the spot that she was. Remember in the beginning of the story, she was sitting on that glider when he pulled up and came to a halt or to a stop, and now she's there waiting as he as he leaves and she's watching him leave and i love how he says no one else just me because this was his special time with his grandmother don't worry memo i won't ever forget there is um this is the website to tell you to go get the tea cakes recipe but i've already showed you where to do that remember it is on his website and i put the link in the schedule if you want to go and check out those um, recipe for those cookies, maybe you can make it with someone in your family. All right, my friends, I hope that you enjoy this book as much as I do. And um, if you want to read it again or you want to share this book with someone in your family, you can find it on Epic. Thanks so much.